Welcome back to the Beginner's Guide to the Modern Theory of Polarization, a series of modules to help you understand how the electric polarization is defined, calculated and measured in bulk periodic solids. Brought to you by Schrodinger's Kittens Productions. In this module, we'll discuss how the polarization is measured and we'll see that we can reconcile our theoretical finding that only polarization differences, but not the polarization itself, are single valued with the experimental situation. But first, a quick reminder about units. Remember that the polarization is the dipole moment per unit volume, and that the dipole moment has units of charge times length, and the volume has units of length cubed. So the units of polarization are charge per length squared or charge per unit area. Usually we report ferroelectric polarizations in microcoulombs per square centimeter because this gives us nice numbers. The units make it clear that if we cut a solid perpendicular to its polarization, the surface that the polarization points away from will have a charge of minus P microcoulombs per square centimeter, and the opposite surface will have a charge of plus P microcoulombs in every centimeter squared. We'll discuss some of the consequences of this surface charge later in the series. For today, we want to see how it is used to measure the polarization. The experiment that we are going to describe is called the Sawyer Tower measurement. It's perhaps not the most widely used method for measuring polarization today, but it's my favorite for illustrating the concept nice and clearly. We start with our ferroelectric polarized in one direction, up say, so that the top surface is positively charged with P microcoulombs per square centimeter and the bottom surface negatively charged. Here the light colored ions illustrate the positions in the corresponding centrosymmetric structure and the cations have shifted up relative to the anions to generate the polarization. The ferroelectric is placed in a capacitor geometry with metallic electrodes adjacent to each surface. The free charges in the metals then screen the surface charges of the ferroelectric. At the top surface, electrons in the metal accumulate at the interface, and at the bottom surface, electrons are depleted or holes accumulate, whichever picture you prefer. The orientation of the ferroelectric is then reversed by applying an electric field. The cations shift down relative to the anions in our cartoon, the bottom surface becomes positively charged and the top surface negatively charged. And the charges needed for compensation in the electrodes are opposite. The new compensation is achieved by electrons flowing through an external circuit from the top electrode to the bottom electrode so that the holes are left behind at the top surface and at the bottom surface the holes are filled and the same number of extra electrons is added. As the electrons flow from one electrode to another, they're counted and the number of electrons that flow per unit area of the ferroelectric surface gives us a measure of the polarization. Notice that the number of electrons that have to flow through the external circuit per unit area of the ferroelectric is twice the value of the polarization. Think of it that P microcoulombs of electrons for every square centimeter of surface have to leave the electrode to get rid of the opposite compensation, and then another P microcoulombs per centimeter squared have to leave to make the compensating holes. Also notice that we are not measuring an absolute value of polarization, but a difference in polarization between the up and down polarized states. So the experimental situation 
is quite analogous to the theoretical one. Before we leave this topic, have a think about possible sources of experimental error in a Sawyer Tower measurement. You should find one that would give an underestimate of the true polarization, as well as one which will overestimate the polarization value. When you're happy with your answers, come back and join us for module six in the series. We'll discuss an example of how the surface charge associated with the polarization can lead to unexpected physics at the interface of two apparently non-polar materials, lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. Thanks for listening.